Okay. Um, welcome, everybody, and a, a greeting from the heat of Texas um, to wherever you are on this globe. Um, this is the July uh, webinar of FinFest 20. 21 FinFest USA 2021 virtual lecture series. We continue today with actually two lectures. We have Ayla Stepanova and Frog, who both give, uh, give a lecture, and we will then have a question and answer session at the end uh, of both, after, after both lectures. So uh, when you think of a question, you can just write the question on the Q&A, um, uh, space there at the bottom of your screen. Um, there's also the chat available if you need to communicate something to the panelists or the moderators. So my name is Helena Halmari and uh, my co-moderator is Scott Kaukonen. We are both from Sam Houston State University and Journal of Finnish Studies. Um, uh, the co-sponsors with FinFest uh, for these virtual lecture series. I do want to remind you of the, uh, the uh, music series that is every other month. So uh, next month in August, we will August 28th, there is a music series uh, by Eric uh, Peltoniemi. And he will be talking about his uh, Finnish American musical journey. Uh, so uh, make sure you register and that way you'll get the links and the pass codes. Uh, this, uh, these lectures and the music series, these are free for everybody. Uh, we do recommend that you, um, or we wish that you, you could donate a little bit of something uh, to FinFest on the FinFest web page. Another practical issue is that uh, we, we will have uh, there on the FinFest page, let me just see if I can quickly share this uh, screen. So um, here, is the FinFest webpage and, uh, and you've got the list of the remaining uh, lectures and music, uh, music series programs. So next um, month we have Eric Belton in my Finnish American musical, uh, musical life. Uh, and we also have, um, have resources available. So if you click this link, you'll get to the resources and after, Ailas and Frog's lectures, we will be posting in a few days, we will be posting uh, posting resources. So if you want to read a little bit more about the topics uh, and learn more about the topics, that's a good place to go and, um, and uh, check, check that link. And here we have the past lecture recordings if you missed a lecture. So, um, Let's uh, get started. Any questions, put them on chat uh, or and questions to the question and answer session. So uh, let me introduce our first speaker to you. We have Ayla Stepanova and uh, the topic of her talk is women's laments alongside the Kalevala, forgotten symbols of Finland's nation building. This is going to be really a fascinating talk because uh, many people, most people have heard about the Kalevala, but, uh, but there is this other genre, which uh, is a, a poetry genre, and, and that's what Ayla will be talking to us about. Ela Stepanova is a Finnish folklorist specializing on Karelian and more broadly on North Finnic lament poetry. She received her doctoral degree at the University of Helsinki. She is recognized as the foremost active expert on Karelian laments in the world and, uh, and as an expert on Karelian culture more specifically, more, more gener gener generally, uh, with a variety of field work experience. 
Ayla is currently executive director of the Society of Karelian Culture, and we're very happy to have her here from her summer cottage in Salo, Finland. <laughs> Welcome, Ayla, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, and I would like to thank all organizers. This is wonderful uh, event. Uh, so wonderful that we can connect with each other from all around the world and uh, participate in discussion without the need of uh, traveling anywhere. So just a second. Um, and I would like especially to thank Helena Halmari for all of her work <laughs> she put uh, contacting us and we are so busy sometimes we are not answering the emails immediately. So thank you Helena for all of, her, of your work. Thank you. And it's wonderful to be here in a summer Finland cottage. We have a log cottage which is very nice. It's evening already so I hope it's not very dark here. It's after seven o'clock. So um, in my lecture, I will discuss Karelian laments uh, in the context of national romanticism in Finland, starting uh, from the 19th century up to the present day, beginning with Elias Lernroth, who was also the very first collector uh, of this tradition of women's poetry. In the context of national romanticism in 1800s, this genre of traditional poetry was important in Finland's nation building project, but has been forgotten in the shadow of Lundert's Kalevala. Everyone nowadays knows the Kalevala, everyone in Finland and probably more generally around the globe. You recognize it as something positive and important, even if you've never read it. But someone mentions lament or lamenting, on the other hand, uh, it sounds like something very sad. Uh, it looks, uh, if you look at the synonyms for lamenting, uh, lament sounds like something boring or gloomy or bitter, or like um, it might be just a pitiful groaning. Similarly, something lamentable is something very bad and deserving severe criticism. All of those sorts of associations are quite far from the glory of Kalevala and from the images that the word Kalevala brings to mind. However, in my talk today, I will show how beautiful lamenting and laments are, how meaningful they were and still are for the people who performed them and how important they also were for the creation of the Finnish nation. But before I began, begin my talk, I thought it would be nice to tell you a bit about uh, how I am connected with lament poetry. I am Karelian myself. I was born in the USSR in the Republic of Karelia. Uh, both of my grandmothers were lamenters. However, my mother, Alexandra Stepanova, chose a different path. She became a researcher of Karelian lament poetry. I, in my turn, decided to follow in my mother's footsteps and became a second generation uh, lament researcher. During my uh, mother's career, she not only published the results of her research, but also recorded laments on more than 50 fieldwork trips. I am still far, far away from her achievements. Today, uh, first, I would like to provide you with some background information about Karelians and Karelia, and generally to answer the question, why I am talking about Karelia and Karelians when the topic of my lecture is Finland and Finnishness. Then I will introduce you to Karelian laments, their language and meanings. And in the third part of my talk, I will talk about Karelian lamenters in Finland. I will illustrate each of these topics with different stories about different women. Karelia is a transnational territory in both Finland and Russia. And Karelians are distinct ethnic 
group with their own language and culture who have always lived within the present national borders of both Finland and Russia. This large area is now populated by, by multiple ethnic groups, including Finns, Russians, Ukrainians, and Karelians. Until around 1930s, the majority population was Karelian uh, with their own distinctive language and culture. Today, however, Karelians have been largely assimilated to Russian or Finnish cultures, and the Karelian language with uh, its three main dialects is highly endangered. This map on the slide uh, represents the areas where you can find Karelian speaking population today. Numbers of Karelians in Finland have uh, greatly increased through immigration. The first wave of immigra immigration from Karelia was around 1920s, after the Russian Revolution and Heimosodat, the wars of kindred peoples. Uh, then, um, at that time, around 20 or 30,000 refugees uh, moved to Finland, which was approximately 1% of population of Finland. Then in 1944, Finland lost a large part of Finnish Karelia to the USSR and over 400,000 evacuees uh, moved, were relocated to Finland, which was uh, approximately 11% of the population of Finland. And among those people, uh, uh, approximately 30,000 were ethnically Karelians. The third wave of immigration started after the 1990s. Um, about 25,000 people from the Republic of Karelia uh, moved to Finland, including myself. Uh, ethnically, it was a diverse group. Among those were Indian Finns, Finns, Karelians, and Russians. There are many Karelias. Uh, depending on whom you are asking. For some people, Karelia is only the area around the Lake Ladoga and parts of the Karelian Isthmus lost by Finland after World War II. And pardon uh, me for my poor drawing skills on the computer, but you can see the drawings there on the map. Uh, for others, uh, true Karelia is the region called Vienna Karelia in the north, the so-called mythic cradle of ancient Finnish culture and history. Or it might be called Eastern Karelia or Russian Karelia, meaning the territories of the Russian side of today's borders. Uh, but some people also think that the only Karelia is situated inside the present borders of Finland uh, in the southeast in Joensu or Lappeenranta. These regions are, are called in Finnish Northern Karelia and Southern Karelia and people there speak uh, southeast dialects of Finnish language. So the whole picture of who Karelians are and what Karelia is, to, is turned um, turns out to be as messy as my drawings here. How many uh, Karelians are there now? In Russia, there are about 61,000 Karelians. In Finland, it's more complicated. There are around 11,000 speakers of Karelian language, it's different dialects, but nobody knows how many people have a strong Karelian uh, ethnic cultural identity based uh, for example, on their family heritage. Traditions collected in Russian Karelia, so-called Russian Karelia, were crucially important for building Finnish identity or Finnishness during the era of national romanticism in the 19th century. In the 19th century, there was a strong idea to search for ancient, authentic culture, a search that looked to uneducated peasants, the folk, as the people among whom such ancient culture could be still found. Folklore and the other things related to the folk and peasant culture provided the most cherished symbols for establishing the nations in Europe at that time, a trend that was also prominent in Finland. 
before the rise of national romanticism, in some of the European travelogues, for example, Karelians were viewed negatively as primitive pagans, as dirty, uh, uncivilized, uncivilized, sorry, <laughs> uncivilized and undeveloped. Uh, after the 1820s, however, these views started to cha change due uh, to the growing interest in the ancient history of Finns in connection with Karelia, its past and present culture. Since the 1820s, so-called Russian Karelia was significant for the collection of folklore, especially mythic epic poetry, which made it crucially important for creating the Finnish national epic Kalevala. Elias Lönnrot, one of the most significant collectors of folklore in Finland, created versions of Kalevala as modern literary products from oral folk poems of people of Finland, Karelia and Ingria. Uh, in order to reconstruct ancient Finnish history and culture. Immediately following the publication of its first edition, the Kalevala became extremely meaningful in the creation of Finnish national and ethnic identity uh, within the framework of national romanticism. Already in the process of collecting folk poems from Karelian singers, Elias Lundrud aimed at translating and adapting the language of the songs in his field notes from Karelian to make them more understandable for him and his audience in Finland. The people who had sung the poems in Karelia to Lundrud and his fellow collectors were just passive carriers of tradition and their lives were oriented towards the past. This notion was essential in Karelianism, a cultural movement that emphasized the role of Karelia in the construction of Finnish culture. In Karelianist terms, Karelia was a channel to bygone days. As one of the Karelianist Grunkvist put it, and I quote, in Russian Karelia, there are uh, among our Eastern brothers all the way behind Lake Ladoga, you can get hold of such a magnifying glass with which anyone can see centuries to the future and to the past, end of quote. In the process of creating and reinforcing Finnish language, culture, and more generally Finnishness, the Karelian language and culture were implicitly absorbed into Finnish cultural heritage. And as a result, nowadays, common public does not differentiate between Finns and Karelians. And this is why I am talking about Karelian folk poetry when we are looking at Finland and Finnishness. Elias Lundrud, as well as many other collectors of Karelian folklore, were interested not only in Kalevalaic poems, but in other genres of folk poetry and traditions. One of the points of interest of the Finnish elite was the genre of lament poetry. And now we will look more closely at what laments are, who performed them and why. <clears throat> Laments are sung poetry of various degrees of improvisation, but they uh, follow uh, some rules of traditional verbal expressions. They were most often, often performed by women, and I would say only by women. Um, <clears throat> uh, they were performed in different ritual contexts and also in different previous occasions. And laments are, um, one of the oldest uh, and most universal genres of folk poetry. <clears throat> they have been known all over the world and are still found in some cultures of the present day. The Karelian lament tradition has been more or less systematically documented since 1835 by Finnish and Russian Karelian scholars. Finnic lament traditions uh, are primarily preserved in Orthodox areas. Uh, there are approximately 5,000 
texts of laments preserved in different uh, archives. We have ritual laments uh, connected to funeral, wedding, or conscription to military service or men going to war. Uh, we also have different non-ritual laments uh, who just, which are expressing the sadness and grief of lamenters and the whole Karelian community. Uh, thus far, the last documented lament was recorded on video in 2010 by a Finnish journalist of the Finnish national broadcast company, Ule. <clears throat> Karelian lamenters were mostly illiterate uh, women of rural communities. For the lamenters, laments were part of their life and the life of the community. Laments were necessary for communicating with the other world, with the dead members of the family. They were important for ritual activities during wedding, funerals and departure ceremonies. And they were very important for expressing feelings of loss and grief in everyday life. <clears throat> the very first laments preserved in the archives, as I said, were collected by Elias Lundrut in 1835. Lundrut had heard laments for the first time uh, only the year before, in 1834. This was when he was visiting the most famous Karelian poet, Arhip Papertonen, in the village of Latvajarvi. And I can quote for you uh, Lundrut's own description of this scene. And I quote, when I came to Arhippa, a small child was dying. In the evening, we all went to bed, but the child's mother stayed by his bedside. After sleeping a little while, I was awakened by a piercing, deeply touching, yet ear-splitting crying song, which child's mother started the moment after his death. No one could even think about going back to bed. One could only think about how to save his eardrums. This was more, of, uh, this was more or less bearable, at least when the mother was crying and singing alone but it did not take long before somebody brought from the neighbors uh, an older experienced lamenter whose voice was seven times more piercing than mother's, end of quote. Then Elias Lundrup describes the ritual that takes uh, place after somebody's death. Uh, in the end of his description, he says, the whole time, woman uh, made this distressing and pained crying song resound again and again. As they cried, they were continuously hugging each other and members of the family. Luckily, I was saved from all of that hugging. This kind of expression of grief is here called crying song or lament. However, I have to leave aside the content of these songs until later. In the following year, in 1835, Lundrut tried to write down some laments, and I quote, on April uh, 22nd, which was a Wednesday, I left Rukavara Papila almost empty handed when it comes to collecting Kalevalaik poems. On the very last day of my stay, I got some laments from old ladies, but they are not of any great value. I've tried to write down some laments before, but I wonder what's wrong because it doesn't work. It seems that they are of an ancient quality because they contain terrible words, which you cannot understand or comprehend, nor from the first, nor from the second time they repeat them. And again, if I ask about some words during the session, then half of what was previously said or written down is forgotten by the lamenter and by the transcriber so that the text is never complete." End of quote. So here we have Lundrut, the best collector of folk poetry of the time who collected thousands and thousands of lines of Kalevalaic poetry, cannot copy down a single one of these women's songs 
So what should we make of it, of this? What was the big deal? How could it be so hard? The problem was that the language of Karelian laments is a sort of secret coded language that is highly metaphorical. There is no fixed text. Each lament is unique. Each lament is improvised within the particular situation. There is no fixed meter. So that's why when Lundrud tried to ask women to repeat something, they just don't repeat the poem because they are making it uh, on the spot. But most important uh, and most prominent feature of Karelian Lament is its highly metaphorical formulaic language, uh, which is not easily understandable to outsiders. There are substitute names or words for all relatives, intimate people, objects, and phenomena, and almost nothing is named directly. In Lament language, you cannot say simply mother or house or boat or uh, uh, who, I don't know who, uh, everything is, um, uh, for everything there are own substitute names. Uh, there is a dictionary of Karelian lament language made by my mother, Alexandra Stepanova, uh, and this dictionary contains more than 1400 different circumlocutions for the uh, different <clears throat> object and, objects and people. Within the, there are special rules uh, in this language of Karelian laments and within the rules of the language, uh, lamenters can create different words or those circumlocutions or substitute names. And here are some examples. For example, Kanta Yaiseni, my sweet carrier. Valkia Vuali Yaiseni, my sweet white cherisher. Uh, those uh, means mother simply mother. The mother who is carrying the child, uh, the mother is who is cherish, cherishing the child. And the next one also ex expressed uh, the term mother in more complicated way. And note the beautiful alliteration, everything starts with K. Uh, one who is into the dear world for eight dear months, carrier, my dear bringer, just means mother. Kallis kaisla kanta maiseni, my dear club brush, sweet carried one. So carried one is the child. Of course, if mother is a carrier and cherisher, then carried one and cherished one is the child. Kana maria kanta mani, my chicken berry carried one. Uh, this special language is probably one of the reasons why lament tradition is disappearing. In order to lament, you have to learn this special language. And why this language was so special? Uh, Karelians believe that the people or beings of the other world, the dead members of the family, cannot understand normal spoken language. Uh, they understand only this special language of laments. And if you don't use the language of laments, then you cannot communicate with the other world and its beings. Most uh, substitute names are positive. And here are a few more examples. Olkaoksaset, dear shoulder branches, means hand. Krustalnoi kuvaset, dear crystal pictures, a mirror. Kultalaita kiekkoset, dear golden aged discs, means sun, the sun. Piattomat heboset, dear headless horses, means car. And within the rules of this lament language, lamenter uh, has a freedom to create different new words again and again. And the only negative, the, usually everything is very positive, but negative is for Lamenter herself. She is unhappy woman, poor thing, or tired body, poor thing. And for strangers and grooms, uh, 
strange, strange taking once a child of stranger, or under spruce thickets swarmers, spruce thickets animals, which means groom's retinue, they were viewed negatively. So when uh, this is what the words of lament uh, are like, it becomes easier to understand why Lernroth had such difficulties trying to write them down. Actually, laments were like speaking in another language, not poems that were learned by heart. So Lundruth thought lamenters could not remember the poems they were singing, but for the lamenters, they were just telling things in their special language and could say the same thing with different words every time they repeated it. Now, uh, Lundruth thought traditional poetry was important for ancient knowledge that it might contain. This was very different from uh, why lamenters thought that laments and lamenting were important. To illustrate how meaningful laments were for lamenters, let me tell you a story about a funeral. With this story, I'm going to take you from the 19th century to the 21st, 21st century. The main heroine of this story is Praskovia Savelyeva, who was known as foremost expert on uh, ritual laments. In the 1970s, my mother met this very talented lamenter. Since 1970s, uh, scholars have recorded approximately 100 different laments from Savelyeva. She was not only a lamenter, but also a storyteller, ritual specialist and healer, as well as singer of folk songs, both in Karelian and Russian. She was illiterate woman. During the Second World War, she wasn't able to flee before Finns occupied the area of Soviet Karelia where she lived, and they took her to Finland where she was forced to work for the Finnish army. And she told me in 1998, she performed her first laments there while washing Finnish soldiers' uniform, when she had no idea what had happened to her family and she was feeling isolated and alone. After the war, she was returned to the Soviet Union. She was married twice, but never had any children. And when folklore collectors first began interviewing her in the 70s, she was a widow and her laments were mainly about how, uh, about her own loneliness and that she had never had any children. She was so well known and respected as a lamenter that people from her own and other villages uh, ask her to come and lament at funerals, weddings, and uh, farewell ceremonies. Praskovia Savelyeva died on the 15th of June 2002 in her small village of Manduselga in Russian Karelia. Some relatives and neighbors gathered together to say their farewells. By 2002, however, there was no one else left in the area who could perform laments for Praskovia at her funeral. This situation created a sort of crisis a crisis that could end in tragedy because traditionally laments were not just important for expressing grief. They were believed to be essential for the deceased to successfully make the transition from the world of the living to the world to the dead. Savelyeva was a strong believer in this tradition. And if there were no one to lament for her, she would never reach her family in the other world. This was a serious concern for Praskovia already in uh, the 1970s. She knew in advance that this might happen. So what did she do? She recorded seven funeral laments for her own funeral with, the, with help for, uh, of her relatives and folklorists. So she recorded them in advance. These laments are rather surreal. The lamenter is lamenting to herself about her life and death before she has died. The time and effort that went into finding a strategy, organizing the recordings and having them played at the funeral 
are a testament to how important laments were in Karelian traditional culture. Now that we have seen how laments were important to lamenters, we can jump back in time again to the uh, 19th century. We have seen how important Karelian folklore was uh, in the 19th century, and uh, now you have an idea of what lament poetry was uh, like and why it was so challenging for Lundrud to write down, uh, even though the, he recognized that it was probably important. Other collectors of folklore who came after Lundrud um, also saw laments as important and they brought lamenters into the spotlight as symbols of culture and heritage alongside Kalevala in the 19th century national building project. And that brings us to another story. My next story is about this old Karelian woman, Matyoi Platponen from the region of Suistamo, Finnish Karelia. She came from a famous Sodikainen family of Kalevalaic poetry singers she was married uh, for 15 years until her husband died, and she was left uh, a single mother taking care of uh, their five uh, kids at the end of 19th century. She never remarried, and once her oldest son, Ivana, established his own family, she moved in with them and lived there for the rest of her life. She was an outstanding lamenter uh, in her community. Uh, she performed laments during numerous weddings and funeral rituals in her village and was highly appreciated uh, by people in her community. She was not only a lamenter, she was also a healer, a midwife, singer of Kalevala Kalevalaic poetry. She lived in her small village totally unaware of the wave of national romanticism which had uh, been gaining momentum um, among uh, the Finnish elite. Enthusiastic collectors of Karelian folklore met Platonen for the first time in 1900, uh, but they didn't record any laments. They were interested in different types of folklore. Only later uh, was she, uh, she was uh, discovered as an outstanding lamenter by Finnish ethnomusicologists. Armas Otto Weissenen, and after that, Weissenen became Matyoi's manager, arranging her performances at festivals and other events. Beginning in 1906, she performed on stage at musical festivals for two decades, both in Karelia and in Finland, for example, in Helsinki. The audience of these events were mostly the elite who were fascinated by the exotic songs of this old woman. She met some famous members of Finnish elite, such as and the artist Axel Gallen Kallela. Matthew Platonen met the president of Finland, Lauri Christian Relander, in 1926 and performed the lament for him uh, that expressed her greetings. In 1928, in Helsinki, she performed the lament for King Håkon of Norway, who was very impressed by her song, shook her hand uh, and asked for the text of her laments to be sent to him. Here in the photo, you can see Matthew Platonen in the middle, meeting the King of Norway and other high status persons. Her last performance was in Hungary in Budapest in 1928 at the third Congress of Finno-Ugric culture, where she impressed all of the guests and participants with her original performances. Matthieu Platonen was also selected as one of the main characters in the ethnographic movie, uh, Haiden Vietto Karjalan Laulumailla, Wedding in Poetic Karelia, <clears throat> which was filmed in 1920 in Suojarvi. She performed as, in this silent film as a lamenter for the bride, and I will provide you some links um, uh, to this film so you can watch it. 
And here I would like to remind you that the elite in Finland back in those days was Swedish and Finnish speaking. And the lamenter Matthew Platonen was performing in the Karelian lament language, which is not comprehensible for outsiders. In the newspapers, Matthew Platonen was called the mother of Karelia, symbolizing the idea of ancient Finnishness, representing the ancient culture and history of Finns that had been discovered in Karelia. The laments Platonen performed that were elevated uh, to symbols of culture and heritage were actually just part of her everyday life. Uh, there was nothing exotic about them in themselves. Matteo Platonen died in <clears throat> 1928 when Finland had been already independent for uh, 11 years. She was called the last lamenter, the last pure authentic lamenter who passed away. But was she really the last or even just last in Finland? Before my next story, however, I would like to remind you that in 1944, Finland lost a large part of Finnish Karelia to the USSR and over 400,000 evacuees were relocated uh, into Finland and among them uh, 30,000 ethnic Karelians. Karelian evacuees were relocated all over Finland and relocation in new regions was very hard for many evacuees, Karelian evacuees. They were strangers coming to Finnish towns and villages, speaking a weird language which, were, which was reminiscent of Finnish, but wasn't quite right. They were mostly Orthodox, while the majority of Finns were Lutherans. They were mocked because of their traditions, habits, religion, and language. Thus, in the 1940s, a widespread process of assimilation of Karelians to Finnish culture began. Many of evacuees didn't want to look strange, lamenting, for example, in graveyards, banished in this assimilation process. Among the evacuees were also Matteo Platonen's surviving family. The granddaughter of Matthieu Platonen, Claudia Platonen, was relocated as an evacuee to the region of Kiuruvesi in central Finland. Claudia Platonen grew up uh, in the lost Karelian territories in Suistamo. She acquired the traditional Karelian ways of lives, um, the most common rituals, songs, and poems. She heard her grandmother's laments, and she knew how much the Karelian laments uh, and lament poetry was appreciated in Finland. Claudia discovered herself as a lamenter and her first lament she performed at the age of uh, 36. Uh, as Claudia Platonin described it, strong feelings of missing her lost home first drove her to lament. And for those laments, her model was her famous grandmother. Claudia's laments mostly expressed her own grief and her laments were not initially intended to be performed at the stage. She was just lamenting because she was sad. Later, however, she started to perform at different kinds of small local events and then at larger festivals. Claudia performed laments with great pleasure for anybody who asked. Like her famous grandmother, she also performed laments for Finnish presidents in 1950s to, for President Paasikivi in 1980s for President Kekkonen. Claudia was mainly recognized as a preserver of the exotic lament tradition in Finland. For other evacuees, she expressed the collective grief over lost Karelia. Some evacuees understood what she was lamenting about in the Karelian lament language. Others, and especially Finns, saw her performances as just one more Karelian thing of which, luckily, uh, they were tolerant. In the media, Claudia become, became called the last lamenter, as her grandmother had been. Up until the end of the 1980s, 
a few other lamenters of Karelian background performed on stage at different local events and also for tourists, representing the exotic and ancient Karelian culture, culture in Finland. These lament performances were quite marginal, especially in contrast to the performances of great Matthew Platonen, the mother of Karelia. And generally, those performances remained invisible to the broader public and also to the elite at that time. But at the end of 1990s, Finland experienced a lament boom. Beginning at the end of 1990s, a movement of neo-lamenters began in Finland. It was made up of people adapting and reinventing Karelian laments in a modern, mostly urban Finnish environment. The small group of activists found out about traditional lament poetry and they were fascinated by its expressive power. Most of the activists talked about the idea that modern Finnish people had lost the ability to express feelings and particularly grief. So in the late 90s, these people started the first courses of lamenting. They wanted to experiment with lament as a way to release block, blocked up feelings. Neo lamenters in Finland have an official register organization called the Anella Itkiat, the lamenters, or literally those who cry aloud with words. Activists of this movement based their knowledge of lamenting on collected archival materials as well as on research literature. So there is now uh, have been approximately 200 lament courses uh, since 2001 and approximately uh, 2000 participants. They also uh, uh, um, give courses for teaching lamenters. Some of the establishers um, of the neo-lamenter movement were of Karelian background, but neo-lamenters do not want uh, to exclude anybody and invite everybody interested to learn uh, to lament. Uh, their focus is their individual feelings and uh, uh, therapeutic function of laments. And here is Pirko Filman, who is the face of uh, neo lamenters in Finland and who is the one of the founders of this movement. She is a public persona, has given dozens of interviews, participated in public discussions and uh, documentary films. She was born in 1937 in Sortavala, uh, one of the uh, lost Karelian <coughs> Uh, cities. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, when Pirko, uh, her grandmother was a good lamenter, and when Pirko created her first lament, uh, Pirko's mother said that it sounds exactly like when Granny was lamenting. Pirko performs laments not only on stage um, or at festivals and concerts but also during different kind of modern Finnish family rituals, including funeral, wedding, uh, graduation ceremonies, and baptisms. However, Pirko Filman also created laments about important current social and environmental issues. In her lament to Mother Earth, uh, she grieves over environmental issues caused by human beings, for example, the cutting of forests and destroying uh, natural resources. Pirko sings her lament, uh, laments in Finnish language, but she also uses some Karelian words. New lamenters try to respect the old traditional language of Karelian laments by using adapted and simplified uh, substitute names in their laments. Neo lamenters are mostly well educated, middle class women and men living in the cities. Some of the neo lamenters actively teach the art of lamenting to anyone who wants to learn. There are a few artists uh, in the neo lament scene, and some neo lamenters are, or some neo laments are even subject to copyright. 
Pirko Filman describes laments as holy and able to heal the soul. So the foundation for practicing laments is oriented to self-healing. This movement has created a completely new community around lamenting, a community that embraces everybody, everyone interested, irrespectively uh, of ethnicity, language, or religion, focusing on the individual's feelings and often on therapeutic benefits of laments. However, neo laments commonly present their work to the public at large as reviving an ancient Finnish lament tradition. And here again, we can hear the echo of the ideology of building Finnish national identity on the basis of Karelian culture from 100 years ago. This notion of the Karelian tradition being Finnish is very deeply rooted in people's minds. So Kalevala is the symbol of the Finnish nation that everyone recognizes today, but women's laments were elevated beside it, performed for presidents and kings during the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century for the celebration of Finnishness and ancient Finnish culture. By the end of World War II, however, laments had become seen as different as something Karelian immigrants did to grieve their lost Karelia. When the laments were relocated with the evacuees, they were no longer remote. They were, uh, they were not longer remote where they could be seen as something in the idealized past. They were next door in the present. Today, however, Laments are making a return, resurrected and reinvented as a new symbol of Finnishness and Finnish culture that is simultaneously open to embracing anyone, irrespectively of language, ethnicity or gender. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ayla. Thank you, Ayla. Thank you. This is, this is truly fascinating. And I'm sure you are opening up a, a, a theme that uh, that is not all that well known to uh, to us American Finns and not even even to everybody in Finland. We have a number of questions, but we'll save those questions till um, till the end. Thank you, everybody, for writing your questions. You can do it on the question of Q and Q and A. Uh, function, or you can type them on the chat function. The Q and A comes to the moderators and the panelists, and and will uh, will answer all those questions. Um, in the in the um, interest of uh, staying within our uh, our schedule, we'll move on and have have uh, our next lecture uh, start right away, and then then we will uh, go over over all your questions and, and thank you for everybody for joining here. We have over 140 people, so that's fantastic. So um, the next lecture is entitled The Viking Age in Finland. Something Some that, can you hear? Yes. Okay. So uh, here is uh, here is Frog, and uh, Frog is the lecturer for the for the second uh, presentation today. Frog is an Academy of Finland research fellow and an associate professor of folklore studies at the University of Helsinki. He specializes in early Finnic and Scandinavian contacts and cultural reconstruction. Uh, he received his PhD from University College London in 2010 and uh, an associate professorship from the University of Helsinki in 2013. Uh, from 2011 to 2014, he was coordinator of the Vikingi Aika Suomessa project, Viking Age in Finland project, which produced the books Fibula, Fabula, Fact, Fibula, Fabula, Fact, The Viking Age in Finland. Uh, I love the alliteration and, and an alliteration conference is actually where I first met Frog and Ayla. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, this uh, book is, we'll, we will be posting 
in the resources the the link to the book because it is uh, available open access online. It was published in 2014 and it's co-edited uh, uh, with Frog and Jonas Ahola with Clive Tolley. He has also published uh, another edited book on this topic, The Viking Age in Åland in Ahvenanma, Insights and Identity and Remnants of Culture. And uh, this uh, book, Frog has edited uh, again with Jonas uh, Ahola and Jenni Lusenius, and that also came out in uh, 2014. So, uh, let me give the floor to Frog and we'll learn about Vikings and Finland. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Helena. And uh, first of all, I just want to thank the organizers for, for arranging all this. I think it's fantastic to be able to have an opportunity to, to uh, talk with you about this topic, which uh, is something that's really exciting for me and that I've worked with for a very long time. Uh, <clears throat> And it's something that I, I feel like uh, a lot of people are less familiar with, um, that they're in terms of uh, uh, simply not having a very clear understanding of what the Viking Age was in Finland. So we can just start off with the, you know, the basic question, well, what, what is a Viking? I mean, because today we tend to imagine Vikings as, you know, big men in furs with horned helmets, roaring around on the seas in square sailed boats. Um, and the actual square sailed boats or ships is uh, uh, historically accurate, but nobody was really wearing horned helmets in Northern Europe at the time. Uh, this is partly uh, an idea that came out of a, a, a really, uh, exciting discovery that was made in the 19th century of, of helmets with horns um, that looked very dramatic and turned out to actually be from the Bronze Age. So they were a few uh, thousand years too early for the Vikings. And this combined with some of these figures that are called weapons dancers that look like they have something of horns on their heads. Although the uh, images that are up there turn out to, to have faces and seem to be birds, even if the what exactly they represent is still a mystery, but, but no one was actually wearing horned helmets. This is very much a modern idea. And it's very common today to talk about Vikings as though they're some sort of an ethnic group. And this is an idea that's been really reinforced by the, uh, the modern television series, uh, The Vikings, where the characters talk about the Vikingness of, of uh, one another and that you know we should be Vikings we want to be Viking people should be Viking um, as though this is some sort of a, a a clear identity of their community and of their society they see their talk about themselves as Vikings but in Old Norse uh, the the Scandinavian language uh, Vikinger actually meant something like pirate and to be e viking uh, literally in Viking, meant to be on a Viking raid. So being a Viking, it wasn't an ethnic identity. It was more like a career choice or, you know, a summer job. You know, you go off, you make some money, and you come home and study during the winter. Um, but uh, this also, when we look at some of the medieval sources, the ways that this was used, uh, we find that it wasn't specific for Scandinavians. So in the saga of King Olaf of Tryggvason, uh, we find the statement that uh, when the young King Olaf and his mother sailed east across the Baltic, they were attacked by Vikinger. Those were Estonian. So they got, they got attacked by Estonian Vikings. And so it's, it's important to recognize that Vikings, the way that the word was originally used was not for specifically Scandinavians and it certainly wasn't for an ethnic group. So when we come to this, well, when we're thinking about a Viking age in Finland, uh, how does that work? Uh, so, cause we have two, two things here that we're bringing together. On the one hand, we have a Viking age and well, what is the Viking age here? Uh, this is a question about historical periodization that we need to open up a little bit because it's uh, the Viking age is this, this periodization process is a construction of images of history and, and its significance for us. And, and, 
Uh, that's an issue that we need to open up if we want to answer this question about a Viking age in Finland. And the other part of this is, well, what was what is Finland? I mean, because if we're talking about a thousand years ago, there, there were no national borders that define Finland as a geopolitical space today. So it raises question, questions of geography and of language and the ethnicity of people that we have there. Uh, and these are other issues that we really need to take apart if we're going to talk about a Viking age in Finland. So let's first address this question of, well, what is the Viking Age? And here we need to, you know, we need to think that time is a continuum. And when we talk about something like the Viking Age, this is part of the way that we break up history into periods that helps us talk about the past and to think about it. Uh, but it's also based on things that we today or in recent times identify and interpret as meaningful. Um, we can say that this is it's, uh, an anthropocentric uh, idea of the past. Uh, and this means it's people-centric. It's all about people. So we pull out moments and features of human history and, and we, uh, the features that we focus on when we talk about something like the Viking Age are linked to culture. And that periodization is it's not based on like some absolute thing in time or absolute thing that happened to the world, but it's about culture and what happens in societies and to people in the world. So if we talk about the Iron Age, it only begins when people have iron and are doing things with it. It's not about when iron was first something in the world. It's been around here for millennia before we have an Iron Age of which uh, the Viking Age is usually considered the last period in the north. And periodization is something that we need to keep in mind that it evolves so that by talking about a period, a period like the Viking Age, we're in, in a sense creating that period by the way what we pull out of it as meaningful in the way we talk about it. So, but then, you know, this brings us, so what, you know, I mean, this is, that is that this just talking about general abstract things or what, but really uh, what I want to bring into focus with this is that the Viking Age is a construct um, and it's built on how we talk about it, especially how we talk about that today is often built on ideas that are, are sort of not necessarily fully connected with the past or not connected in ways that are relevant to what we might think about as a Viking Age in Finland. Um, the Viking Age as a construct is it is a period of Northern Europe. So when we talk about the history of, of Italy or something, the Viking Age is not relevant at all. And this construct, it is created in dialogue with empirical evidence. And we'll, we'll come back to that. Uh, it's normally defined in terms of uh, from about uh, AD 800 to 1050. And this is partly linked to uh, sort of key events that are sometimes brought into focus is the beginning and end of the Viking Age. Uh, so the first recorded Viking raid, which occurred on an abbey near York, is dated to 793. And this is often treated as the beginning of the Viking Age. And uh, 1066 is uh, the Battle of Stamford Bridge. And this is when the Viking uh, the Viking raiders and the Viking forces were considered to be defeated. And that was sort of the end. That's often seen as the end of the Viking age. Um, but <clears throat> there, when we look at the Viking age in these terms, certain features are brought into focus that make, you know, that are seen as the, what makes this the Viking age. And this is seeing Vikings, Vikings as hostile seafaring raiders. And this is key to our modern images of Vikings, but it's also a perspective from England. Uh, the Abbey near York, where we have our first Viking raid, is actually only a few hundred miles from the Battle of Stamford Bridge. These are both in York. So actually the framing of the Viking Age is really from the perspective of the people who were being raided from it in the British Isles uh, in many ways. And the ways that it gets framed are looking at Scandinavians as pagans viewed through Christian eyes. Um, and this is the period when we talk about the end of the Viking Age uh, it normally is 
discussed in terms of the coming of Christianity and the medievalization of the North so that we end up with this transition uh, from paganism in the North to Christianity and the Christianity brings writing culture and medieval knowledge and, and literacy and so on. Uh, and the construction of the Viking, the Viking as an agent and uh, the Viking age is something that took place in the era of Romanticism. Uh, this was, uh, and this is in itself really important for understanding the Viking age and the way that we talk about it and think about it today, that this was uh, especially in the 19th century. This was a, an era for creating national identities, which Ayla has just been talking about. Uh, but at this time, being Christian was a common European identity. So Europeans, Europe was a Christian, uh, a broad sort of Christian arena. And Christian nations differentiated their identities from one another according to ethnic and linguistic identities. And now, if Christianity made groups the same in Europe, pre-Christian culture, mythology, and religion became something that uh, these different nations could turn to for symbols uh, to build ethnic and national identities. So these were very powerful uh, symbols that they could draw on, and then they were linked to ideologies of the time about how these pre-Christian cultures. These were expressions of the spirit of the folk and uh, mythology and oral poetry and so on. Uh, now, the concept of a Viking really was built up in the 19th century as a sort of brave, independent, adventurous hero um, who was free of bureaucracy and determination by the church. It was an image that's actually uh, the Swedish poet, um, Eric Gustav Geir, uh, he wrote a poem called The Viking. Uh, and this was very important in contributing to this image and bringing the Viking into focus. Uh, <clears throat> And this gave, you know, created this image of someone who is capable, you know, uh, uh, reliant on his own strength in this time, the time when men were men and women wore helmets too. Um, and it created the Viking as a symbol of freedom from social determination and from uh, social restrictions. And that is an aspect of the Viking image uh, that has continued through the present day. Uh, but it's also, it was a politically charged identity that was, it was really very tightly connected to heritage construction and uh, the sort of creation of a Scandinavian identity and more broadly a Germanic identity. So Scandinavia had uh, a lot of the, uh, the sources for Germanic mythology and for this medieval uh, sort of pre-Christian culture, a lot of those resources came out of Scandinavia and especially out of Iceland that were also being drawn on by people in Germany, people in the British Isles to construct a sort of Germanic cultural heritage. But this symbolism of the Viking has uh, continued through the present day. So we see this, the images from that era keep being reproduced. They become uh, uh, used in a number of ways that connect very strongly with, uh, with identities and images of people today. And we see that even in uh, the series, The Vikings, I think it's quite interesting that the image of Vikings over time seems to keep up with current trends. So the images of the, uh, the actors or the, the people who are uh, Vikings in these times have changed to increase it to match their hairstyles with uh, people you might see in a nightclub today and we see the the rise in popularity in tattoos and tattoo art as it becomes this very general widespread uh, thing we also see it reflected in representations in Vi of Vikings in a way that we didn't say 30 years ago uh, but of course it's also taken hold in popular culture it is we find it reproduced everywhere and it's it's actually spread quite quickly in new ways so we find it in Japanese animation of course there are the uh, Marvel's Thor movies but even in in Legos which you know I would of course probably have loved when I was a kid uh, 
But here is where we end up with that dial, the potential for distance between the way that we construct images of uh, the Viking or Vikings in, in modern discourse and modern discussion and the reality of the past that, you know, part of it is that the, the equation of Vikings equals Scandinavian, as I said, is false. Um, that being a Viking was something that somebody did and probably only a small portion of Scan the Scandinavian population went on Viking raids. You know, most people were just farmers and it, it took a lot to be able to gather a whole bunch of people and leave aside all of your work on the farm and go off sailing at a time of year when you probably had to be busy with crops and things. Uh, but the era, what, is, what characterizes the Viking Age is a, a massive increase uh, in mobility. And it's partly related to, uh, or it's greatly related to changes in technology for seafaring, for shipbuilding, and what ships could do. Um, but again, the mobility wasn't strictly just for Scandinavians, even though the explosion of this movement um, was very, uh, Scandinavians were very central to this. But and it produced this connectivity across the North Atlantic from the Baltic Sea to Greenland. But on top, and uh, that movement in the North Atlantic is where much of our image of Vikings comes from. So that's, that's where we tend to focus. We tend to focus on Vikings as these people who would go out to, they would go out to sea and they would sort of appear on the shores of an ocean, attack people and then sail away. Uh, but a huge part of uh, what the Vikings were also, or what, uh, what characterized this period, uh, was also on what is called the Eastern Route that went through Russia, uh, what is today Russia, into the Middle East. And there, this Viking raiding was not important, uh, partly because, you know, if you're on a river, the question is not where did they go, it's did they go left or right? Um, so, these ideas of uh, raiding and you know uh, the way that Vikings were active uh, in the Viking Age, the modern images are very much concentrated with these uh, the kind of seafaring Vikings uh, activity, whereas much of the Scandinavian activity that was concerned or characterized the Viking Age went east and went through these inland waterways, and these uh, we end up with lots of activity related to trade. Um, and cultural contacts. And at the same time, uh, these same groups, people were also circumnavigating Spain and going to the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, <clears throat> and a big, another big part of this period was uh, Christianization, that we saw the, the spread of Christianity through the North. And this was the uh, discourse of what made the Viking Age very appealing in the era of Romanticism was connected to the idea that this was the last pagan era. These were the last adversaries of Christianity. But uh, whereas within Scandinavia, it was really about uh, political centralization, which for which Christianization became uh, an instrument. It became a tool politically in many ways. But again, this was not all about and only about Scandinavians. So if we look at <clears throat> what was happening in this era, um, the connectivity is actually, it's, it's quite impressive. Um, and in many ways, this movement across the North Atlantic uh, to the West and the uh, movement through the Eastern route uh, to the East and then circumnavigating Spain, this was actually creating in many ways a connectivity that defined Europe or brought Europe together in the modern sense uh, for the first time in a way that it had not been done before, uh, something that we have actually maintained through the present day. So where is Finland in all of this? Uh, well, usually if we talk about Finland in the Viking Age, people tend to imagine it as, you know, like the, the southern half of Finland or maybe the southern two thirds and then part of Karelia and then maybe or maybe not the Oland Isles, islands, which are here in this uh, smaller circle there. But <clears throat> when we're talking about trying to get to the Viking Age in Finland, uh, one of the things we face is that there's a, a big chronological gap between different types of sources. Uh, a lot of attention has been paid to archeological material 
especially in the last <clears throat> across the last half century. Uh, <clears throat> whereas linguistics and folklore and, and some other disciplines have received less attention. Um, now, if we look at this little diagram here and the historical cultural environment that we want to get at is the Viking Age, we end up with an archaeology ends up with these material outcomes. Things happen and uh, you can dig it up or find it in the landscape or something uh, <clears throat> 2000 years later. And <clears throat> but there's a big gap. So we end up with synchronic outcomes from historical events. And then we end up with 2000 years that uh, separate those outcomes from the researchers and the research perspectives. Then in between, we have written evidence that, you know, we end up with church documents and medieval sagas that also produce material outcomes that, you know, might be from 1200 or something like that, that preserve not just a text, but also a material object that may have uh, illustrations and so forth. Whereas linguistic evidence and folklore evidence are, they belong to intangible cultures. So they get transmitted through generations uh, <clears throat> and uh, they continue on and we only get evidence of them much, much later. So there was no written language for the Finnic languages until the 16th century. And much of what we use is what we have as evidence from folklore was recorded in the 19th and 20th century. So we end up with much richer perspectives where researchers could actually interact with people. Um, but we end up with a huge gap in terms of the distance or the, the number of centuries that this intangible culture was transmitted before we actually get to uh, the ability to interact and get those uh, get access to that. So trying to coordinate these two types of perspectives is um, extremely challenging. And uh, <clears throat> Helena mentioned this Viking Age in Finland project, which was really oriented towards multidisciplinary uh, collaboration. This was a big part of what we did. We brought together a huge number, of, uh, huge variety of disciplines to get different perspectives on uh, what we can and cannot say about uh, the Viking Age and uh, the people there, the cultures, what happened. Uh, so, <clears throat> and we didn't just bring together linguistics, folklore, and archeology, span but we also had things like, paleoclimatologist, a paleoclimatologist. So we basically got a weather report for the Viking Age in Finland. It was unusually warm and dry, but it was hard to maintain crops because on a yearly basis, the weather was quite unpredictable. Um, <clears throat> but part of this project or part of what drove the project was that disciplines, uh, all these different disciplines had worked apart for a really long time. And uh, the Viking Age had tended not to be brought into focus, <clears throat> although it had been, say, in the first half of the 20th century, and then people got very cautious about combining disciplines and things, uh, precisely because of the problems of how to link the different sorts of data. Um, <clears throat> And, but linking different types of data can do, you can do all kinds of cool stuff with it. So uh, for example, the, uh, <clears throat> the word humala, which mean, means hops, like as in beer, uh, <clears throat> this is something that, well, you know, it, it might be as borrowed as late as the Viking age, but linguists can't actually tell, they can see that it's, it's been borrowed, but it could be any time across centuries before that, that it was used. But this can be combined with evidence of say pollen and that shows in the material record in the archeological record, pollen shows when plants were, began to be cultivated and hops began to be used and cared for in Finland during the Viking age. And this is something that we can actually, it makes it, probable that hops as a word was borrowed from Scandinavians at the same time that it began to be cultivated. And it makes it likely that cultivating it during the Viking Age is linked to Scandinavian language because that's where we get the word. So we can do you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, <clears throat> and there's a lot of, you know, one of the things that's uh, uh, a lot of the attention on the Viking Age started is, has centered on the archeological record, material culture. And we have a lot of things that can distinguish. Uh, we can distinguish cultures in Finland that way, um, such as the, uh, 
the brooches up in the upper right hand corner here, this type of round brooch is something that's characteristic for Finland for the Viking Age. Uh, it's actually interesting, it's really interesting in terms of, you know, medieval or Viking Age style, because all the women were wearing these pairs of brooches. Um, but you could see different regional uh, and cultural uh, patterns according your cultural difference was not in whether you wore the brooch but actually what design you had so the Finnic uh, uh, women in Finland and Karelia were wearing these nice round brooches um, and that was something that set them apart but they were participating in these broader networks of style uh, another thing uh, that comes from the uh, is distinctive for southwest Finland of the Viking Age are these uh, bronze what are seen as bare tooth pendants, which are interesting because they actually show uh, this is supposed to be a tooth and the cast bronze actually shows where the string should be wrapped around it. Um, but these are something that we find only in Southwest Finland and then a couple are around the Gulf of Riga where we can see that somebody moved in the same way with the, where the, you find these, uh, these characteristic brooches of women, when we find them at a trading, the trading center in Birka in Sweden, uh, archaeologists say, ah, the woman who had these must be from Finland. Um, <clears throat> and then, of course, the archaeological record shows us all kinds of stuff like uh, uh, it shows how Finland, people in Finland were participating in international trade networks, like these are swords that are the so-called Ulfbert swords, where there's a runic inscription that says Ulfbert on them, apparently a big, big fancy brand name and swords from the Viking Age. Um, and also we find like uh, here, this object on the left is the, this is uh, a fragment of what would be a magical staff, uh, something that it's the only example in Finland, but it's a Scandinavian type. So we see sort of Scandinavian magic also being adapted into Finland in these networks. But uh, <clears throat> when we go into those types of practices, the, like the staff or these uh, bare tooth pendants, we start moving into intangible cultures, uh, intangible culture, because these connect to beliefs and understandings about the world or how it works, supernatural forces and so on. Uh, and this is what we end up with, with things like funerary practices, such as uh, a type of, or in the Finnic cultural areas during the Viking Age, everybody basically did cremation. There's one cultural area where you do, you have burial mounds as in Scandinavia, um, but otherwise everybody was doing cremation and especially what are called cremation cemeteries under level ground, where basically you have a, an area that's just filled with really big rocks. And after people were cremated, the remains and the things that were cremated with them would be uh, scattered among these rocks, rocks that creates questions about the meanings of individual and collective identity. And <clears throat> but a lot of what you see in the, what you see in the archaeological record are simply the outcomes of practices, but not the practices themselves. And here's one of the things that becomes very interesting to think about in terms of what was happening in the background of these is because a lot of things happen at a funeral and this is one of the things that Ayla was just talking about with us with Finnic lament traditions and as a common Finnic heritage we can expect that there uh, were almost certainly lament traditions connected with these funeral practices because these are funeral practices that spread from southwest Finland to Karelia and these are part of the formation of Karelian culture. So alongside these burial practices we would have uh, performance of laments and presumably the, uh, the sort of some significance of laments and their importance for the transition to the other world uh, there, but we could also think about differences between how those practices were at that time versus what we have in the modern times, because one of the things that uh, lamenters often do is they describe the scenes or the processes of, that are happening at a, uh, at a funeral, and in funerals where these where laments were recorded, this included things like uh, building the coffin, whereas at uh, in the Viking Age, it probably would have had something to do with uh, describing the preparation of the funeral pyre and these things. So there, it doesn't mean that the practices were necessarily the same, but they would be evolving in relation 
uh, not simply evolving in isolation, but in relation to all sorts of different practices. But <clears throat> uh, a lot of what we did in the project concerned uh, bigger, sort of broader questions that like, how do we relate language and culture in the archeological record? How do we figure out which culture is which? Because archeological cultures looking at sort of the way that you know, where people live, what kind of burial practices they had, and so forth. There, it's not as straightforward as it used to be, uh, used to be commonly assumed that you could just say, oh, well, this culture is this, and, you know, they, they must have spoken that language, and so on and so forth. So we were uh, trying to coordinate evidence of archaeological culture with linguistic evidence, and this is part, includes things like place names, uh, which show us where people spoke different languages at particular times and what languages were spoken when, say, Phoenix speakers first arrived and, and borrowed names for the things in the landscapes like lakes and rivers. Or rivers. Uh, and also we can look at uh, loan words. So what kind of, because when we have words borrowed into a language, it tells you what languages other, the people they, con they met spoke. Um, <clears throat> so in this period, uh, during this time, the Viking Age is actually the time when uh, the what's called uh, Proto-Finnic or the common Finnic language began. It was still actually dialects at the, the beginning of the Viking Age and began to separate into separate languages. Um, and <clears throat> so in this, uh, in this map here, you can see in Southwest Finland, that's mainly where the, what became Finnish uh, was and then Karelian ended up over in these areas on the Karelian Isthmus and uh, north of Lake Ladoga. And then what became Vepsian, another closely related languages, uh, was further east. And then Estonia and these, these areas is where we end up with uh, uh, languages that became Estonian. Uh, one of the things that we find from the linguistic evidence is that by the Viking Age, uh, by the end of the Viking Age, actually, the Swedish speaking populations in Finland, when they started to come, uh, arrive to Finland in the 1100s, they didn't meet people with who were Swedish speaking or Norse Scandinavian speaking that they could show a continuity of language from. So actually all of these areas would must have been Finnic speaking by that time. Um, but most of what was Finland and Karelia during the Viking Age were uh, places where uh, Sami dialects and perhaps other languages were spoken. These were different mobile, mobile groups. So mainly uh, the fixed settlement areas were uh, areas where uh, Finnic was spoken, whereas in these mobile groups, mainly what was actually proto-Sami or pre uh, of Sa what Sami languages come from, uh, were spoken in those areas and possibly other languages. And there's this, uh, in Ostrobodnia, there's a settlement area where uh, it looks like the Finnic culture spread, but it's this sort of burial practices. We have the cemeteries under level ground, but recent research on linguistics has shown that actually they weren't Finnic speaking. It looks like they were, they were speakers of some other language. So um, that's just kind of a fun fact. <clears throat> But uh, this, what we have during this time is that uh, this is the time when Finnic languages or, or the, the languages that became Finnish and Karelian were really spreading. Um, so in the, just before the century before the Viking Age in the 700s, uh, this is when this so-called Eastern route was opening up. And this was a huge draw east, and this is where Scandinavians are, identi are often identified as, you know, the Vikings who went east on the river routes, and they, they <clears throat> became leaders among the Rus, who became later the word that we get our Russian from. Um, but actually, the people in southwest Finland had been active in trade routes to the east for a long time, and they were also drawn to the east with this uh, opening of trade, this changes in the trade routes there. And that movement seems to be where Karelian comes from. So we actually see the spread of the burial practices, the, funer the cemeteries moves on to the Karelian Isthmus and around Lake Ladoga. And <clears throat> the language that became Vepsian 
which is further east, uh, it, it's not clear that this actually spread with culture. It might actually have been something that, uh, that Finnic language was simply very important for trade and that people who were contacted, you know, being dis using Vepsian to talk to each other, simply started speaking it as a main language and that it's, it was that it may have started as a trade language, um, as a sort of international language, you might say. And the spread of language from this time is uh, actually linked to land use and livelihoods and then these trade networks that the Finnic speakers started to settle around waterways uh, and places linked to inland mobility. <clears throat> and then they spread from there. And then it was just as a historical process, the Finnic, uh, these Finnic groups were not, they didn't centralize and consolidate power. What they, what happened was that they got caught between the centralization of power from Sweden and that which was in Novgorod, which uh, later became Russia. <clears throat> and basically as the, those two developed into larger and larger kingdoms, they just sort of cut a line, a political line that moved back and forth across the centuries uh, that went through Finland and or Karelia, depending on the year, basically. Now, <clears throat> with the spread of language and culture, we can actually look at uh, uh, language, culture, and religion from later periods and get an idea of what happened because Finnish and Karelian spread north through all these uh, different areas and all these multi, uh, these uh, Sami uh, speaking groups and other mobile groups, uh, they were, they seem to have been assimilated. And this is reflected quite strongly in the uh, by the oral poetic tradition, which was maintained, especially in Karelia, it disappeared more quickly in the West, and uh, uh, especially in Western and Southern Finland. Whereas in Karelia, it was maintained in uh, Orthodox areas, and this this includes short epic and kalavalamitra and incantations uh, <clears throat> that were circulated as as texts, more like what Elias Lundrot wanted to collect uh, rather than laments. And they weren't just stories that people would told, tell in whatever words again and again. Uh, so, but these were not necessarily Kalevala, which was Elias Lundrot's creation from them, but they were integrated with uh, uh, practices, and this is where you know we see the mythology. We can see the rituals, the and these rituals and and practices were uh, integrated with views of the world, how it worked, how the body worked, how it was understood, and what we don't we see this also that Karelian lament spread all the way to the north with this. What we don't see is practices that we would identify from with Sami being. Uh, maintained in these areas. So it looks like the, the use of land was connected with practices, with language, and this was connected with ritual specialists, mythology, and so on. And as that spread, it actually, uh, it spread north through Karelia and through coastal Finland. And actually a lot of those mobile cultures, they, do, they weren't simply pushed north gradually, they were enclosed and they simply couldn't do their mobile lifestyles anymore. And they didn't just shift to language. They went through a whole, almost like a conversion process to the uh, mythology and the type of vernacular religion uh, that was maintained in these areas. So <clears throat> uh, let's just turn to some perspectives, what we could take away from this. Uh, you know, when we talk about the question, coming back to the question of, well, you know, was there a Viking age in Finland or what was it? Uh, this easily turns into the question, were there Finnish Vikings? Which is a slightly different question. Um, the groups in Southwest Finland, uh, they actually were mobilized when the Eastern route was opening. And this is part of where we end up with Karelian culture. But actually their, their networks became oriented towards the Baltic Sea and towards inland trade in the Southwest. They, they weren't really strongly connected to the Eastern route after that. And this is also Oland on the other hand, was, I mean, they were more active in a sense uh, <clears throat> to the East. Karelians on the other hand, 
are actually quite interesting because they get identified as raiding in Sweden and even reaching, crossing this, the Scandinavian peninsula overland and into Norway during the 12th and 13th centuries. So they're actually characterized as Vikings, uh, possibly because they were the pagan other of the time, uh, but by Christians in Sweden. And they're, they're actually said to have burned the uh, trade center of uh, Sigtuna to the ground, uh, <clears throat> even though the reliability of accounts uh, is not actually clear. But what we can see in historical records is that Karelians did have a special, they had a, a special sort of status in relation to Novgorod. So they weren't simply taken over by the spread of Nov Novgorod's power. And they seem to have... Uh, uh, retained some authority and, and done activities in the Baltic Sea, at least, um, that was different from uh, what we might otherwise have expected. Um, but <clears throat> uh, we also see that there's, there, they were active on the Eastern route, and we see this in, in uh, we see the activity on the Eastern route, we see trade and expansion. So we see parallels to the activities of uh, Scandinavians, but in a different direction. So the activity ends up being directed more inland towards Finland and Karelia, what become Finland and Karelia. And actually that orientation is what produces Finland and Karelia as Finnic uh, cultural areas. So they, you know, Finns and Karelians were not necessarily Vikings, that, but it does, we do see that the Viking Age was relevant and that they, the people in these areas did similar things. And here again, we need to remember that the Viking Age was more, it was about more than Vikinger as raiders, which was mainly something identified with the North Atlantic, not with the inland river routes. And, <clears throat> but this also creates the interesting question that if the Viking Age ends with Christianity, was it longer in Finland and Karelia? Because Christianity uh, actually spread there later, which is one of the reasons that uh, Karelians end up represented as Vikings, uh, essentially, by uh, Swedes, in the, uh, by Christian Swedes. So, <clears throat> And this is, when we look at the, the Viking Age, when we bring it into focus, it turns out to be, uh, it looks like a pivotal period in the history of these, the Finnish and Karelian groups, that basically they begin to uh, become mediators of trade with the inland cultures. And that makes Finnic language and culture uh, very important for these inland areas in a way that Scandinavian and Slavic doesn't seem to have been. And that position shaped the future of these cultures and their spread. So Finnic shows up as the dominant language in these regions or in Finland and Karelia by the 1100s and onwards <clears throat> for these fixed settlement cultural areas. Um, and even though we can see there are earlier periods where we can say that there's been some sort of Scandinavian immigration and Scandinavian contact, they must have been assimilated, at least linguistically, by that time. And then we have this spread of language and culture, which simply assimilates um, the mobile groups so that they start to move over to these fixed settlement livelihoods. And when they become part of that fixed settlement livelihood, especially into the Middle Ages, when that's linked to uh, administrative and bureaucratic things being imposed by different kingdoms, uh, they, we see that these other groups get assimilated also culturally and, and uh, in some sense religiously as well, um, probably owing largely to social economic pressure. Uh, and then this advances through the historical period up to the present day. So, <clears throat> But then, you know, when this turns as well, you know, we've got Vikings and we've got the Viking Age. Oh, that's great. But uh, one of the things about talking when we talk about it in terms of Vikings, it often, you know, something to keep in mind is that actually that ends up connecting things back to Scandinavia. Uh, if we talk about Vikings. And this moves us back into the questions of heritage construction and also the political construction of alignments of, uh, between different cultures. And this has been going on for a very long time. So images are, are very, very powerful and they continue to be and they get used in a number of ways. 
uh, and they continue to be used wisely, widely. But it's very interesting that this was already done uh, over a century ago with things like uh, Akseli Galankala's uh, paintings, uh, which he also used these sort of square sailed ships and Viking Age type figures. Uh, <clears throat> But uh, images of warriors, Iron Age warriors in Finland, interestingly, they will have swords and these sort of symbols of status associated with Iron Age warfa warfare, but they have no horns on their helmets. Um, that's something that's lacking. Occasionally, we actually find shaman drums. Interestingly, the uh, Finnic religion did not use, uh, their ritual specialists did not use drums. We don't have that uh, evidence of that. That's something that's mainly, that's a Sami thing, basically. Um, but these processes continue through the present day. And it's, it's good, it's interesting to look at the Viking Age as a period and, and its importance for Finnic culture, but also to keep in mind that when we start to bring in, if we start to talk about Vikings, we start to move into connections uh, that may have political implications or be part of discourses uh, that work in different ways of creating cultural connections or cre and creating cultural distinctions, like uh, uh, the uh, an image of a helmet with uh, deer antlers and a, a shaman drum. So on that note, uh, I think I'll just wrap up there. So thank you very much. Rob, thank you. Thank you so much. This is absolutely fascinating. What a treat for everybody to hear these two, two speeches, two talks, and also see a glimpse of a Finnish garden in your window behind you there, uh, since we can't travel there yet, uh, easily at least. So wonderful. And uh, so we have questions, um, and we have plenty of time, actually, we can, uh, we can use about half an hour for the question and answer. And I'm gonna let Scott handle most of it. And I'll throw in a question if something comes like, you know. And I'll hop anything. over to Ayla's computer. So we'll be on one screen. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you, Ayla. Thank you, Frog. Um, there are several questions here, Ayla, and I try to pull together as one because mostly they're asking about connections to other kinds of songs and traditions with laments, for example, to the Sami yoke or to the Humpa um, or to Ingrian traditions. Um, so maybe you could speak about that. Like how, how, does, how do the laments connect to other ethnicities and other traditions in the region, but also around the world? Well, the question, and of course, uh, <laughs> I could give another lecture about <laughs> the lament uh, poetry and its connections uh, uh, to the world poetry or about the Phoenix laments. So seriously, um, uh, laments are found everywhere in the world, like truly. <laughs> um, nowadays it's, um, you know, you can find them in Greece, in Balkans, in Indonesia, Frog and I, we were recording laments in Bali. Um, and uh, so it's everywhere. And it's everywhere, this kind of sung, uh, grievous poetry used in rituals. Uh, it is very distinct. It's, it's, it does not remind uh, any other types of poetry. So I cannot really say if it's, if laments are related to whom I, I never, you know, found anything like that. Uh, among the Finnic people, laments uh, are known uh, or were performed uh, in Ingria, uh, there are Vepsian laments, there are Karelian laments, there are Setu uh, people's laments. So all over Finnic people, we have lament traditions. I strongly believe that Finns also had lament poetry uh, previously, maybe before the, um, uh, the, the Lutheran religion strong influence, but we don't have any Finnish laments recordings. So they, are not, they were not preserved in, preserved in 19th century. And all of the Ingrian laments, Karelian, Bepsian, Setu laments, they have the same kind of lament language, the principles of lament language. So we, we can see 
um, similarities among them. Of course, the, the expressions are different, maybe melody is a little bit different, but we see a lot of, a lot of common features. Uh, about the other genres of, um, uh, for example, Karelian poetry, uh, we have not Sami yoiks, but Karelian yoiks, uh, which were also performed for their weddings or for the other people and so forth. So uh, language of Karelian laments and Karelian yoiks are similar, is similar. And then we talk about, we can talk about the Sami uh, culture and Sami yoiks. Um, recently, I think it was the beginning of this year, Marco Joost, a Finnish researcher uh, on Sami music, published an article, very wonderful and interesting. Uh, and he is talking about Sami laments. He discovered in uh, uh, archival materials, materials, Sami laments. And he talks about the connection of Sami laments and Sami yoiks. Uh, and it's very fascinating topic, very new one. So um, I'm looking forward <laughs> on hearing more about it. So uh, did I forget something to mention? No, Remind I, me. <laughs> I think you got that. I mean, a, a follow up sort of in the system, Scott Davis, why would a wedding have a lament which seems connected to loss and grief? Yeah, 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 of course. We, we look at the wedding from nowadays perspective. We choose our beloved partner <laughs> here and marry and we, we, you know, we are happy and, you know, all of that. But we, we need to go back into the traditional understanding what wedding was. Um, it, it meant that the girl, the bride, was uh, completely disconnected from her own family, completely. So totally removed and placed to, she was placed into the family of her husband. Sometimes it was, of course, uh, love from the first sight and, you know, this, but sometimes it was just arranged marriage. There, you know, sometimes there was no any love or any, this kind of <clears throat> nice, beautiful feelings. So the laments were, um, making sure that this um, transition and departure from her own family where she was born into the family of her husband was complete and successful. And of course, it was, it was very grievous if you have to leave your family forever and not necessarily see them much after that. And the young bride never knew what kind of mother-in-law is waiting there in the, uh, her new husband's home because uh, the new weds usually moved, how to say, the Karelians usually had the big families or multiple generation families. So the new couple uh, uh, moved to their parents, husband's parents' house. And the head of the family was, of course, the mother-in-law and father-in-law. And the new bride was the lowest, lowest uh, person in the family. So it was very, very tragic event, the wedding. <laughs> very, very lamentable, right? <laughs> very lamentable, very lamentable. And uh, the one feature was that usually bride, brilliant bride didn't lament herself at the wedding there was special older woman who was lamenting for her uh, to make the bride cry and to make everybody around cry about this grievous event. And uh, there was this kind of saying in Korean language that uh, better to cry at your wedding a lot than then after wedding when you are married. So it was actually very nice and it was very good that you are crying a lot because then after that you were, you would be happy, <laughs> happily married. It's like you set a really low bar mm. right, so that anything has got to be better than this the next day. Yes, exactly. <laughs> the Kalevala has a, has, a, has a 
addresses this after the <clears throat> wedding at the North Northland Forum, the Paul Hiller wedding, they have these laments addressing uh, addressing the fact that the daughter of Paul Hiller now has to leave her parents and go and live to these strangers in a strange place. Yes, exactly. This was the whole uh, idea. But also with laments during the weddings, uh, uh, the closest relatives were um, kind of, can you say, transferring luck and, and happiness to the young bride. So, and the interesting part was that uh, uh, so-called crying wedding was only at the bride's house. And then when groom was getting his bride and going back to their new home, the lamentics, lamenting stopped at all. And there was only the song wedding at the groom's house. They were only singing, dancing and being joyful and happy. Um. Throw this question to, to Frogs from Karen Ba. Um, she'd like to hear more about Finnish as a lingua franca or trade language for the broader region going east. Uh, <clears throat> this is something that uh, it looks like Finnic was uh, well. Basically, the the areas to the east spoke languages that were closely related to Finnic, and the. Uh, if you're starting off with Scandinavian as your language, then those are really just, you can't, you don't even have the vocabulary to count. And this seems to have been something that made Oland very important in trade. So very far down on the Volga River, we see distinctively, or near the beginning of the Viking Age, we see distinctively Olandic burial rituals sort of taking over the local, spreading through local culture. So, uh, and the, the use of Finnic as a lingua franca seems to have been, it seems to have gone as far east as uh, Beloya Osoro. Uh, it's not clear how, if it went much further than that, this is an important, how important it was beyond that, but that's where we see Vepsian spread to. And the, the term for the, like what we call the Vepsian, the word we use for Vepsians today, which we see as Finnic speaking, that the people called Vepsian were identified with Beloya Ozero. They, they probably weren't originally Finnic speaking and simply started speaking the language. So a lot of this, like what was actually happening in the area, we, you know, it's still kind of, we have to reconstruct it historically, but we can see the importance of Finnic language for these, these types of purposes uh, going that way. And the, the similar, a similar question arises concerning uh, the spread of Sami language, which seems to have happened through mobile cultures some centuries earlier that, you know, so, pro, the what is called proto-Sami language seems to have spread very quickly through a huge geographical area and just picked up all sorts of vocabulary from Scandinavian, from Finnic and things like that, but is probably related to some sort of trade activity and that it was it was a useful part of it was a lingua franca um and it's uh uh but this is just kind of a it seems to have been a nor there seems to have been a nor uh sort of a southern boundary to it that is where finnic languages were found and it went north and back to ayla and this one um the question about the modern lamenters are they using language that people can understand Thank you for the question. Yeah, uh, when the, <clears throat> this neo lamenter movement began in the end of 90s, there were two schools. The one uh, was saying that no, we have to use Karelian lament language, this specific coded language in order to, you know, really lament and really have a con mythic connection with the other world and, and stuff. So uh, modern Finns must learn the Karelian lament language in order to lament. The others, the other part of this movement, they were saying, no, if we are bringing this tradition into modern Finnish culture and life, we have to use the normal Finnish language. Otherwise, people 
would not connect with this uh, uh, with this poetry. They they simply cannot express their feelings if it would be some strange language. So for a while they were you know split a little bit, uh, but nowadays um, it's probably maybe five years ago, they started to, you know, connect back. So they found a compromise. Uh, so they use uh, Finnish language, modern language, spoken language, but they try to um, kind of, um, how to say, to, to use a little bit of some Karelian um, words or create their own circumlocutions, which might be understandable for the modern Finnish people. So most of the lamenters, neo lamenters, they use normal Finnish language and the laments are understandable, very understandable. Um, <clears throat> I will provide some links with the neo laments, uh, but on YouTube, it's easy to find if you put it kuvirsi and Dirko Filman, for example, but I will provide the list. It's it's very interesting to see and to listen. That's another question too, with, with our lament melody shared among lamenters or does each singer create their own individual melody, like a signature tune for that lamenter? Mm, thank you. Uh, it's um, uh, the melodies of laments, you can see that they are, um, kind of individual. However, laments are following the same patterns or same rules. So it's always descending melody and very grievous. And I'm not the ethnomusicologist, so I cannot describe it very well. And unfortunately we couldn't play the recording what I had via Zoom. Somehow Zoom didn't like the laments. I don't know why. So, so basically, yes, every lamenter laments in her own way. The same as with the language, she follows some rules, but otherwise she is free to create. And the same is with the music. Sort of going back to the neo lamenters, uh, just a question here about with, do they use substitute words or are they just creating? And then I guess I'm the question sort of curious about what language they're in Finnish, but what's the nature of the language that they're using? Perhaps it's, a, it's a practically most of them using normal spoken language with not not the, this kind of coded uh, secret language like, like in Karelian laments, but they might say um, like Kantayani, my uh, carrier about mother. Because it's kind of understandable from the context of the lament or something like that a little bit, but, but not much. So it's mostly normal spoken language. We have a question from Charlotte McDaniel and it, this has to do with, I guess, assimilation and, and cultures. And this may even reflect modern and older sensibilities too, a modern person and, and contemporary Finnish singing these ancient, you know, or these older traditions. Maybe talk a little bit about this tension then between sort of assimilation, perhaps even between like Karelian identity in modern Finland, right? Um, and older traditions and new neo-lamenters and lamenters, like how does, how does that all sort of work together? And, and how does that apply perhaps to what you're doing as scholars? Um, yeah, it's a very interesting question. And I, I don't see any tensions right now among this kind of general public in Finland. You know, nobody have any problems like uh, wearing the Viking helmets or, or I don't know, you know, it's just a part of the uh, globalization probably that you can, you know, uh, sing whatever you want to sing and uh, perform whatever you want to perform. And among the Finnish, uh, modern Finnish people, laments are mostly seen as therapeutic, as, uh, you know, expression of your own feelings and, and healing your, uh, yourself. They are not like in Karelia, 
rela related to the mythic uh, understanding of the world or contacting the other world and the dead people and speaking with the dead. So they are like two different things in a sense. But I must say that uh, because we are talking or how to say, um, relating related to the Sami culture, uh, there is strong talk about cultural appropriation, you know, about Sami culture, about Sami costumes, about different aspects of Sami culture, uh, which is very important for Sami people, but it's used in the tourism or whatever entertainment. So I see that nowadays in Finland, some of the Karelian activists are starting to talk about this cultural appropriation issues. Uh, with the Karelian culture adapted, assimilated, borrowed, or whatever you want to word use, um, so into the Finnish. So for some of the Karelian activists, and especially youngsters, it's a very, very, uh, uh, how to say, difficult issue. Not, not only about the laments, but about the Kalevala. So there is strong discussion about whose Kalevala is. Mm -hmm. And that's as researchers, we try to, we are not taking sides. Mm -hmm. Is Kalevala stolen from <laughs> Karelians? We are not answering mm -hmm. those kind of questions. We are looking at the processes, what happened, how it happened and what people fe fe felt about it before and what they are thinking now. You probably yeah. have something to add to that. Uh, yeah, I, I think just for the uh, <clears throat> the question of the issue of, of uh, whether there's a tension is part of the reason that there there is not an issue of tension is that you don't have uh, sort of uh, uh, Finnish people adapting lament alongside a living tradition where people are identifying with it and you also don't have a really strong image of, you know, this of uh, say Karelian saying, laments are Karelian heritage and these are symbols of our identity or anything. It's just that, oh, people are lamenting. And they, so there's, and the tension only comes up when you end up like with these younger activists who are saying, this is our culture and this is our heritage. And then, then, it be, then that, uh, produces it as a conflict um so and that's the the same thing with uh Kalevalaic poetry which is very uh so much of of Kalevalamitra poetry that it deals with mythological themes came from Karelia or from from uh Ingria and these uh, sort of non-Finnish like the Azorians in Ingria rather than the Finnish Ingrians uh, but there's not conflicts in those because the people are seeing it, the people who are using it are seeing it as part of their heritage in some way. And there aren't groups that are saying, this is ours, this is our heritage and not yours. Um, so there's, and the, the conflict is only sort of starting to emerge with these discussions of, uh, as the cultural appropriation discussions are spreading to these different groups and, this and people are beginning to question, whose are these really? in a, a, a very modern era in a current context. Maybe, Ayla, so who, the, the, one of the questions is, are young people interested in the modern lament? So one of the questions is, who, who are the people who are the neo-lamenters? Are they young? Are they old? Are they, you know, who gets drawn to these things? Yeah, thank you. It's, it's very interesting because, no, majority are the middle-aged women like a core group. But then there are very, very old people uh, and very, very young people. And now the youngsters are coming, uh, you know, they are more active, they are more interested and there are few uh, f um, uh, folk musicians who are performing laments, young people again. And uh, so there is variety of, uh, you cannot say that this is only for the old grannies who are retired and they don't have nothing to do any anyway and they want to lament, no. And there are men also. It's not only, only females who are coming there. So it's very, very interesting. 
and there are there is international interest yes the one lament course in finnish was um, held in canada among the uh, fin uh, finnish people with finnish heritage uh, then in Sweden and in Spain, because there there are uh, a lot of Finns staying there. And um, what else? Uh, yeah, you, there have been international researchers and artists yeah, have yeah. also come who who don't even speak any Finnish. Um, and I think Pirko gave a lament lesson or course or something in. Uh, in the U.S. In and lectures, yeah, lectures, yeah. lectures of laments in U.S. in in Philadelphia. So, so there are there are a lot of interest. <clears throat> How are we doing on time, Helena? Um, I think we can. Uh, if we have more questions, uh, did did we already address the question about where Ingria is? We did not. Okay, so Ela, I I. I could you could you uh, address? We have a question about uh, clarifying where Ingria is. Ingria is located in relation to Karelia. Uh -huh. It's uh, more more south to the Saint Petersburg in present Russia, and between Estonia. So it's like this territory so, south to Karelia. Yeah, Ingria in the present context is a fairly small geographical area. It's just a sort of coast on the southern side of the end of the Gulf of Finland. Right. So um, we still have, if we have uh, questions. A question, a question from Karen Ba for, for Frog. Um, if the Karelians were sort of Vikings into Sweden and Norway, did they attack the Sami groups? Uh, she says, I have a Sami friend who remembers conflict with Finns attacking the Sami. I'm wondering what the history of the conflict between wondering what the history of the conflict between Finns and Sami is and when it arose. Ah, the question of yeah, the the question of conflicts between Finns and Samis is a that would be a that would be a really complex question because you deal if you're most of what we have records for would be recent centuries. So if you're going back to the Viking age, this is much, we, there have probably been conflicts over centuries and centuries as the fix, basically fixed settlements spread and would interfere with the mobility of these different, cult, you know, these mobile cultures and where they, where they did their fishing, their hunting and uh, those kind of things. And uh, the conflicts with Sami in uh, the Sami folklore traditions get quite complicated to, to figure out because there are a lot of legends about conflicts with different groups, but some of the words that they use for these groups don't actually, they're like chuds. So we don't know what, you know, they say, well, they might be Russians, they might be Finns, they might be Karelians. Uh, so the ethnic terms get, uh, mixed up so it's it's very uh, it's a, a really tricky issue to sort out and conflicts with the Sami are going on even you know you've got them currently today okay um, if I think we have covered a lot of ground uh, uh, evidence of Finnish laments, lament singing in Finland in earlier times. We kind of covered that already. So this has been just, uh, oh, and the religion, did we address that? Is, uh, are the laments aligned with any religious traditions or beliefs? You mentioned, Ayla, that uh, it's more like Orthodox, Greek Orthodox tradition than the Lutheran tradition, but can we even make those kinds of alignments? Uh, it, it, the Finnic lament, so Indian, Karelian, Seto, Deption were preserved in the Orthodox areas because the Orthodox religion was more, you know, kind of whatever, if you're lamenting, we don't care, we, we won't prohibit it, like, but the, the, the other, yeah, the Lutheran, for example, they were strictly against the, all this kind of seeing as a 
pagan or pre-Christian ways of uh, practices. So um, the, the other religions prohibited it very strictly. So that's we are talking why in Finland we don't have documented laments. However, laments are not particularly linked into any institutionalized religion. It is linked mostly to the pre-Christian uh, religious practices and pre-Christian -pre beliefs. Uh, for example, belief uh, of the, you know, other world and the world of the dead. Karelians were not viewing, or how to say, in Karelian folk uh, beliefs. You don't have understanding of paradise and hell and whatever. There is world of the living and the world of the dead. That's it. And, and you can communicate with the other world uh, using laments. That's how the beings in the other world will understand you. So it's this kind of, not particularly uh, religion, but the way of life and understanding of the world. And it's, it's actually quite, it's, uh, it gets quite complicated to talk about it in relation to one religion or another, because the, uh, the, the tra transition to Christianity was uh, basically, when Christianity came to the Finnic peoples, instead of replacing vernacular religion, they they said, "Well, okay, we're Christian," and they assimilated features of Christianity and they they sort of translated it through their beliefs. But you, and this is where you, part of where you have all this Kalevalic mythology and so forth, Vainamoinen and the world created from an egg. Uh, that's because people people saw themselves as Christian and they saw this as you know it, it all made sense to them. But when you talk about laments uh, and their mythology, their way of thinking about the world, there's actually a, a gap between that and this, the same mythology in Kalevalaic poetry and the incantations and things. So lamenters maintain their own sort of mythic worldview and understanding of the other world and how it worked that differed from the, you know, the same stuff that you find in Kalevalaic poetry at the same time. And they must have been maintaining that for hundreds of years. Okay, great. Um, you already addressed the Sami taking part in the Viking activities, I believe that was addressed, yes. So it will be on the recording, um, which will be posted on the FinFest USA's website. And um, it, Kieran is asking, are there good ways for US Finns to learn about these online about these issues online with Finnish institutions or are there good courses for us? Well, it's about laments or the Viking mm -hmm. laments and the Viking age in, in Finland, I think both. Yeah, I think that there is a, that there are, you know, all kind of articles and books about uh, this kind of, those kind of issues. So we will provide the, the links and, and um, materials for that. But Thanks. about the courses. Hmm. Yeah, courses. Course. Ah, but via Zoom nowadays, probably it's possible to organize. So if anybody wants the Neo Lament course, you should contact those Anela uh, Itkia, the, the organization of lamenters. I think that they would love to yeah. do that. Definitely. We had people from Ireland coming to learn laments to Finland, but nowadays Zoom, you know, everything is possible. And probably you could gather a big group to do it. <laughs> yes, that's, well, we have a big group now <laughs> so, <laughs> interest of interested people. I think, uh, I think we, our recording will soon be kind of like closing down. We get the webinar a specific time, that time frame that we can use up. And I think we are approaching that uh, end time. But I want to thank uh, Ayla and Frog very much. And if you could, if you, when you sent that resource sources, some people are asking for your emails, if you could uh, add your emails there, if that's, if that's okay, or uh, they are easily available. If you just go to University of Helsinki and, uh, and so on. So, um, so I 
Thank everybody. A reminder of August 28th, Eric Peltoniemi's music series program. And then in September, we have Tim Frandi talking about the Sami. If anyone's interested, I know any, <laughs> there are a lot of uh, people interested in that. And then on November, we have uh, Andrew Nesting and uh, speaking about his work on Aki Kaurismäki's film. So it's a little bit of a different, different topic, the Finnish film noir. Um, but it all ties together through FinFest. And thank you. Thank you, everybody, a lot. Thank you so That's much. Thank, thank you. you. It was wonderful to see everybody. Thank it you. It was a pleasure. And, and it's still pretty light there in, in, in Finland. Yeah. 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 We have, yeah. It's after nine in the evening and it's still, yeah. you know, sun is shining. <laughs> okay. Well, everybody have a really good weekend and we'll see you again. Bye-bye. Yeah. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. 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 Bye.